And that's really what this book is about. And the central chapter is about the contrast between the privileges we allow our elected representatives and the dangers and privations that we expect our soldiers to endure. I've, um, I know the soldiers very well and I'm aware of their disquiet. And I, I wrote somewhere, I don't normally quote what I write, but I will this time. To a politician, a luxury is a plasma TV. In emergencies, a falling out with a constituency association and a fallen comrade is an MP of the same party who, having been exposed as a flipper and a swindler, has finally been forced into retirement. To a soldier, a luxury is a bucket of water. An emergency is an all-armed Taliban assault on a forward operating base. And a fallen comrade is a friend who has fought alongside him and saved his life and who has remains he is trying to extract from the record of a blown-up armoured personnel care. Let me quote you something. I was, I'm the patron of the Colchester Military Festival. The Paras had an amazing march of 700 plus of their men through Colchester on the, on the 17th of July. I mean, we have no idea what these people go through. Until recently, we have no idea of the privileges that our honourable members claim. Here is a Parachute Regiment's corporal story, direct from the Hellman battlefield, real world and verbatim. When we move, we create a cloud of dust that can be seen for 40 kilometres. There is no safety bubble. A soldier died. The platoon commander asked me if I was all right. I said that I wanted to be alone. And then we cracked on. This is what Kipling said. Kipling speaks to us across the years. Our dead shall not return to us while day and night divide, never while the bars of sunset hold. But the idle-minded overlings who quibbled why they died shall they claim for high employment as of old. And Kipling said after the death of his son John, he changed his mind about war, he changed his mind about the Irish, because John Kipling served in the Irish Guard, he wrote in his epitaphs of the war, if any question why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. I think this speaks to us across the years. We British are now 40 fighting our fourth Afghan war. You might like to wonder who won the other three. We didn't. Uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy, who was ennobled by New Labour in its early months, is a tough Glaswegian lawyer and a good lady who did not have to pay for her title. But she fell out with them, and they with her. And I heard a lecture two years ago in which she described 10 Downing Street as a history-free zone. Think about that. Think where we are with that. Um, a story goes the rounds in the army of a Secretary of State, probably one who claimed £2,200 for a fitted love seat. And there was one who did. And he visits the soldiers in the front line, or near the front line, because he's got to be safe, hasn't he? And uh, <coughs> a silence falls, because they don't know how to talk to the soldiers. They've never done any soldiering. So a soldier breaks it, I think from a Scottish regiment, and he says, excuse me, sir, but how much do you know about soldiering? And the soldier says, well, actually, not very much, sir. But how much do you know about uh, politics? And the squad, says, well, not very much either, sir, but my friends tell me I'm a very good liar. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm nearly done with Afghanistan, but this is absolutely central. There have been two great unfolding stories through the summer in our country. One has been the MP's expenses scandal, and the other has been the unprecedented scale of casualties among our young men and indeed young women in uh, Afghanistan. In the first 10 days of July, what, only two months ago, 15 soldiers died, including the commanding officer of the, of the 1st Battalion, the, the Welsh Guards. And in one ambush, 10 soldiers were casualties. This is the second rifles. Uh, five were killed and five wounded 
And that day, their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Thompson, said, It has been a grim day here in Sangin. But at the end of the day, as we prayed for our fellow riflemen who have given their lives in the service of their country, and for the good of the Afghan people, the bugle made us, major sounded the advance, and it would have been heard right across the valley as the sun slipped behind the ridge. We turned to our right, saluted the fallen and the wounded, picked up our rifles and returned to the rampart. So I'm with, when I'm with the soldiers, I am aware of being with the best of British. And I'm, when I was with the politicians, and I was, I have another feeling. We have some very good and honest and decent MPs. I've been arguing for some years before the scandal broke that the theory of the few bad apples in the barrel was false. The barrel is almost half full of bad apples. <coughs> and has been. And we now know that half the MPs have now paid or been required to repay money that they were given and which they should never ever have claimed. Now you may say this is sour grapes and you'd probably be right. Nobody ever told me about the John Lewis list. <laughs> Nobody ever told me I could charge my grocery bills, £400 a month, to you, the taxpayer. In terms of swindling, I never knew a flipping thing. I worked out that in those four years I could have gained an extra £52,000. Your money, thank you very much. But there comes a time, and I expose in the book, I'm not promoting what I call a politics of three principles. One is the principle of a difference between right and wrong. Another is common sense. And the third is a sense of humour. So at least when things go pear-shaped, you've got some recourse. I don't know how it happened, but I have a theory which I'm going to share with you. When I was an MP, I served on this committee, the Standards and Privileges Committee. I was part of the regulatory mechanism. And I looked around me at the 13 members of the committee. I was the only one without a party. And I realized that in many key cases, especially involving senior politicians who are accused of breaking the rules, including the rules on parliamentary allowances, the junior members of the committee of the same party as the honorable member being questioned tended to side with him because he, and it was always a he, had some control over their future careers. So the system was, if I may say so, and I was slow to accept it, somewhat corrupted um, from the start. There are two outstanding episodes to my mind in recent years of a failure of public trust in public life. One was the dismissal from office of Elizabeth Filkin, the best parliamentary commissioner they ever had, and the other was the disgraceful treatment of Dr. David Kelly. And these things have been done in our name. 